Hi everybody, this is Dr. Powers. I just wanted to put together a little uh, video that's going to go through some of the stuff that you'll see in the challenge activities for module one. This doesn't cover everything, but the stuff that I think deserves a little bit of extra uh, explanation or just uh, examples. So first off, uh, we're going to be just looking at the difference between categorical and quantitative variables. A Categorical variable is a variable that is uh, descriptive um, and uh, doesn't have a numerical uh, meaning to it, all right? Whereas a quantitative would be numerical variable, something that's measured or counted um, and that has a, uh, a clear numerical meaning to it. So first off, a person's income is definitely a quantitative because a, uh, the person's income is something that can be measured. Uh, a cat's breed, however, is something that you would give a name for. Uh, it's a categorical. Level of pain. Now here's one that I threw in here just to give an example of something that um, is uh, a number, but it, it, it's on the scale from one to 10. And, um, and because it's on a scale of one to 10, you would think that it's a quantitative variable. Um, but this is what you call an ordinal variable, and actually it's an ordinal categorical variable. Because when somebody describes their pain as a four, for example, or if somebody else describes their pain as a five, um, the difference between a four and a five is subjective, right? Um, a four for one person is not the same as a four for somebody else. So it's not something that's objectively measured. It's um, and and also, <clears throat> excuse me. And also because the um, because the the difference between a one and a two and a two and a three and a three and a four is not uh, the same for every level of pain. This isn't a quantitative variable. It's actually a categorical variable that's disguised as a quantitative variable. A car model, of course, anything that's a word and not a number is definitely categorical. Uh, the odometer reading in the car, however, is a number and it's measured, it's quantitative. Your zip code is another number that is, uh, it's a categorical variable that's disguised as a uh, quantitative variable. Although a zip code is a five digit number, there's no numerical meaning to it. The zip code could just as well be XQRPL uh, it's just a way of coding things. I mean, there is a, the first two digits do have something to do with the state that you're in, but uh, you can't, does it, it doesn't make sense to say one zip code is greater than another, or what do you get when you add one zip code plus another zip code, right? The, you can, that doesn't make any sense. So as soon as you start thinking about it in that way, you realize, no, these are not numbers, um, you know, in the, you know, you can't like take a bunch of zip codes and average them together and get some meaningful zip code. That doesn't mean make any sense. So it's categorical. The battery level in your phone is it's a measurement, say from zero to 100%, that's gonna be quantitative. And of course the phone brand is gonna be a categorical variable. All right. Now let's, we're gonna do some calculation in Excel. Uh, first off, going to use the absolute value function to get the absolute value of each of these numbers. The absolute value function, for any, any function that you use in Excel, you go to the cell that you want to uh, do something with and type in the equals character. That's a way of telling Excel that you're going to be putting in a formula. So you put in equals and then the function is ABS, ABS for absolute value. Put in a parenthesis and then I'm going to just click over here and select that number. And I'm gonna close the parenthesis, and it's going to give me absolute value. The other thing you can do, once you have a formula in a cell, this little green autofill uh, square in the corner, you can click that and drag it down to other cells in the same column or in the same row. It's going to put the same formula in all of these. And you can see it's done the absolute value for each of these, and each it has this, the cell reference correct. It's the cell to the left, and so that is automatically done when you do the auto complete or autofill. Let's take, take a look at some uh, statistics, the maximum value of a bunch of numbers. I'm going to take the maximum of the 
original values, not the absolute value of them. So the maximum, it's a function, max, max, parenthesis, and I'm going to just select this whole range, click and drag to select the range. You can also type in a4 colon a13, that's the, the upper left corner of the range and the lower right corner of the range. Uh, but you can also click and drag, and that's what I usually do just because it's more convenient. 868 is the highest number in that set. The minimum equals min. The minimum is the, is the min function. And I'm going to do the exact same thing. Select that block, close the parenthesis, and hit enter. That looks right. Negative 637 is the lowest. The count, uh, well, C-O-U-N-T, that counts how many numbers there are in a set. The count function only counts numerical values. So if I count from A4 to A13, I'll get 10. If I counted from A, uh, A3 down to A13, I'm still going to get 10 because the word value doesn't count as a number, and so count doesn't count it. If I wanted to count uh, care, like anything, you would use count the count a function. If I put in count a, it, it's it's just counting things that aren't empty. So that counts the the word value as a non-empty cell. But I don't want to do that. I want to do just regular count. For sum, sum is the sum function. Easy peasy. Select all those. Close the parenthesis. They add up to 2,310. All right, so those, that's the maximum, the absolute value function, maximum, minimum, count, and sum. Okay, we'll just we'll play a little bit with the autofill and talk about it here. Autofill, if you select uh, a, a group of numbers, I think two or three, um, I mean, you can, you can do it with one, but it's not going to be very interesting. Two, I think, is enough, but three, uh, and you click this and drag it down, Excel is going to predict the pattern that you want to have. So I have one, two, three, you would expect you would get four, five, six, seven. And you can see that little seven there, it tells me what it's going to put. Yes, it, it's doing an increasing sequence. It knows what I wanted. Here, car A, car B, car C, Excel, um, you might think that Excel is going to think, oh, you want to do car D, car E, car F. Uh, in fact, Excel isn't so smart, and it's just going to take that same three cells and repeat them, a, car A, car B, car C, car A, car B, car C. So it's not smart enough to do uh, alphabetical, um, uh, al like alphabetical sequence. But if I have the word car with a one, car two, car three, this is something that it's smart enough to handle. So you can see it goes car four, car five, car six. So even if you have a word, uh, like some character, some letter characters, and then the number, it's it's able to get this. Okay, now let's take a look at this five nine thirteen. Here, the difference between each of these is four. Five plus four is nine. Nine plus four is thirteen. So let's see if it increments by four on every step. Yep, you can see what it's doing. It's going up by four to 17, then plus four is 21, plus four is 25, and so forth. So you can do a sequence that increments by more than just one. It can increment by four. And here I'm actually going down from 100 to 95 to 90. So I'm decreasing by five every time. And in, indeed, the autofill can handle, can handle that for me. It's a handy feature, it, uh, especially when you're, you don't want to have to type in this, this, all of these numbers one by one by one. All right, we're going to take this data and create a histogram and a box plot. We'll use the functions in Excel that create these charts. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the charts in Excel, but um, they, they'll do. So you can see that the data is in this column. I'm going to just scroll down. You can see it goes down to cell A62. So I'm, what I'm going to do is click and hold down. I'm going to PC, Control, Shift, and then just the down button will jump down to the last cell uh, in this block. And I'm going to now go to the Insert menu uh, and go to this, uh, let's see, statistical chart is here. It looks like a bar chart, but they all have the same color. That's where you can get your histogram. And I'm just going to put it there. I'll, I'll select them again. 
go to insert menu click <laughs> it's already selected and insert a box and whisker chart I personally don't care much for vertical box plots yeah unfortunately it's just not possible to use the the box plot tool in Excel to create a horizontal box plot uh, I just like the axes to kind of match up with the histogram. Um, but anyway, uh, let's title this histogram, uh, histogram of my data. Really, it's not descriptive because I don't really know what this data is. <laughs> this is a box plot of my data. Not the greatest titles in the world, but again, I have no context for this data. Um, but I just wanted to show you how to create these. Now you can, un for the histogram, you can uh, change, if you select the uh, the axes, and go over and right click and click on format access you can change uh, the number of bins and I can select uh, let's say if I wanted to set the number of bins to be uh, 10 bins hit enter um, you can come back over here and you can see that it's actually got 10 bins that's a, that's quite a lot actually let's just change it to 5 I'm gonna hit enter and what it, it's actually gone and uh, it's modified the 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 bin width when I when I went and, and did that so it, I'm not gonna say anything else mean about Excel's histograms they are doing their best Excel wasn't built for for statistical charts this is something that's been added after the fact uh, uh, but anyway it's better than it used to be <laughs> I'll say that all right let's take a look at um, so the, the histogram, anyway, it's showing you a general shape of the data distribution. Uh, what you, one thing you can see here is that you do have, the data uh, is not totally symmetric. You have a longer tail on the right-hand side. It's not too severe, but it, I, it's definitely noticeable. The data is skewed to the right, which means that you have like a longer tail on the right. Uh, most of the data is sort of concentrated on the left, and you have a thin tail on the right. But it's not too severe. It almost looks symmetric. Uh, the box plot makes it look very symmetric, but uh, I know that uh, the, the, that shape comes out more in the histogram. So let's calculate some samples, some statistics. Uh, the mean is actually, let's scroll down a little bit. These are all of the, the statistics I want to look at. The mean is calculated using the average function. Average, parenthesis, I'm going to go and select my data. Uh, it's from A3 down to A62. So here's my, my function. Average of A3 to A62, 2.43 is the, is the mean. The median is, is found using the median function. And I'm going to do A3 to A, A62. Two point four seven. The mean is slightly below the median. That's what you get when you have a slight positive skew. The median is going to be in the direction of the. It's going to be on the side of the mean uh, where the skew is happening. <laughs> so because I have a positive skew, the median is slightly above the mean. That, that's usually what happens. Although there, there, it is possible for this to not be the case, but uh, that's usually what this indicates. Let's find some other um, statistics. The standard deviation, I'll put it here, stdev.s. I'm going to calculate a sample standard deviation. Uh, usually you have the sample statistic, uh, the sample data. Well, let's just type in A3 colon A62. The standard deviation gives you the kind of the average. It's, it's roughly interpreted as the average, uh, average deviation from the mean for your data. So my, all of these numbers, on average, they're about 0 0.4069 from the mean. That's not exactly true, but that's a, good, that's a good first interpretation of standard deviation. Minimum, we already know this. I use the min function, A3 to A62. The maximum is, as you know, the max function, max A3, A, A62. The range is, well, it's R-A-N-G-E, oops, actually the range, there's not a range function. What you have to do is just take the maximum, this cell here, 
minus the cell here. So the difference between the maximum and the minimum, that is the range. Interquartile range is found by finding the um, quartile. Uh, let's see, there's two different functions for quartile. I'm going to calculate the uh, EXC. I don't know, it, I don't, it doesn't really matter too much. I'm going to put in my array A3 to A62, comma, and I'm going to put 3 for the third quartile. I'm going to, oops, going to take the third quartile and subtract quartile.exc A3 to A62, comma, 1, the first quartile. So this is a function, this is the difference of these two numbers will give you the interquartile range. This is the middle 50% because the third quartile is the cutoff for the top 70, uh, for the bottom 75% or the top 25% of the data. The first quartile is where the, the bottom 25% is cut off. Between that is the middle 50%. Look at that. That's such a long number. <laughs> um, so based on the shape of the distribution, is the mean or the median more appropriate statistic to describe the center? Well, the me the skew is not too severe. If the skew was very severe, I would say I would go with the median because that's the general rule of thumb. If your data distribution is skewed, the mean the median is uh, is less affected by or is not affected by the extreme values in the skewed in the skewed tail. But in this case, I would probably go with the mean because it's roughly symmetric, and I don't think it's skewed enough that it's going to warrant that kind of a... Because uh, the, the mean is usually... is if, if it's not too skewed, then the mean is um, pretty good <laughs> as a descriptor for the... For the unless there, if there's really a lot of outliers, extreme outliers, then the median is going to be a better choice. And when you use the mean to describe center, you want to use the standard deviation. Um, if you're using the median, then uh, either the range or the interquartile range would go with the median. Uh, that's just then generally the the way you pair them because the 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 interquartile range is is the difference between the third and the first quartile, and the median is the second quartile. Uh, but in the standard deviation is the is is based on the mean, so they go hand in hand. You don't want to describe the spread using the standard deviation if you use the median to describe the center. That would be a little mixed up. All right, let's take a look at this. We have I have three uh, sets of data: group A, group B, and group C. And what I have here is just a a, a kind of a distribution shape of what their their um, their density functions kind of look like, or this is generally what the shape of uh, shape of the data looks like. And you can see the same kind of thing shown below in the box plots. Um, so the question is, based on the distribution shapes, which sample has a greater standard deviation? For standard deviation, what you want to look for is which of them has the widest spread. Uh, and it's clear that the that group B has the widest spread. Group A has uh, a kind of medium and then group C has the the smallest. And if I wanted to be sure I can actually just um, the standard deviations for A, for B, and for C, I'll put, I'll calculate using uh, the function stdev dot s and I'm going to select the data So for group A, uh, this is A3, that, let's say A3 down to A152. Yeah, so there's the standard deviation for group A, and I can copy the formula over to column B and then column C. And yeah, you can see the standard deviation for group B is about twice that of group A, and for group C, it's about half that of group A. Yep, that's pretty much what, that's what we expected to see. Okay, so let's take a look at this. We have a box plot and we have some data. Without actually calculating stats on the data, I'm going to attempt to use the box plot to uh, estimate the maximum, the quartiles, and the median, and the minimum. Okay, so the maximum is, is going to be the top uh, whisker, where the top whisker is, and it looks like it's at 19. 
Um, there's no outlier dots that are past 19, so I'm going to go with 19. The third quartile, um, if you look up at the, the top of the rectangle, it looks like it goes up to 16 and a half. I'll say 16.5. That looks like about where it is. Median, um, it's between 10 and 12. But it's not quite at 11. I'm going to go with 10. Uh, I'll actually say like, yeah, I'll just say 10.5 just to not get too picky. Uh, quartile one, that's the bottom of the rectangle. It's a little bit above four. I'm going to just say 4.5. I'm, 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 uh, probably over overstating it a bit, but I'm just trying to be approximate. Um, lastly, the minimum, and that looks pretty clear to be uh, between zero and two, right in the middle. The minimum is one, and um, and there are no outliers. Outliers in a box plot would be identified as uh, dots that are kind of beyond these whiskers. Outliers are defined as uh, points or data values that are more than one and a half times the interquartile range from the, from the top of the rectangle or from the bottom of the rectangle. So if you take this rectangle and you take it and you stretch it by 50% and you stack it above and stack it below, then you have, <laughs> that's basically everything that's a non-outlier, anything within that range. So uh, for this, because the Q1 and Q3 are so far apart, um, yeah, th this this covers the entire uh, the entire range of values are all within that within that uh, that fence is what we call it, and those whiskers kind of we call the, we those block off the fence. Okay, so I hope this has been helpful, uh, and we'll we'll see some more examples in the future modules uh, and especially as the stats get a little bit more tricky. And I uh, hope that you do well. Bye.